Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is actually really good for us. This is our first uh, Dev Nation. We uh, are part of the Feed Henry acquisition. My name is Javier Perez. I'm director of product management. Just put them for uh, Red Hat Mobile. Uh, what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to talk about the MBAS services, or what we call MBAS services, as part of our mobile application platform. Uh, let me actually introduce uh, John Fassell, Ron's engineering team. He's coming from Waterford, Ireland. Kian Clark, also coming from Ireland, although he lives now in Boston, part of the team. Uh, and we're going to talk about how do we do those services, how do we do those what we call MBAS services and microservices. So let me start with a quick introduction of uh, the mobile application platform. And then we jumped into services and discussion about Node.js, which is what we have uh, based our platform. Thanks. Thank you. So this is one of the Red Hat diagrams, right? You're getting familiar with the branding and the styling and the tiny font. Well, that's the diagram. <laughs> that's a Red Hat diagram. Uh, what you see there on that big box is the mobile application platform. You see on the right the app, the mobile devices. You see the tablets, the smartphones. And then on the other side, you see the back-end systems or the enterprise systems, right? Very focused on uh, what we do on enterprise. Um, I like to describe um, our platform in kind of three areas, three major areas. Um, first of all, what we can do for app development. The idea here is you already know how to build apps. A lot of, lot of developers now building apps, mobile apps. Uh, bring your tools. We call it BYOT, bring your own toolkits. Keep using what you're using. We support uh, the type of apps, the apps that you want to build. Native, hybrid, Windows Phone, Android apps, uh, iOS, of course. Um, so very flexible, very open into what you can do in terms of the client side of the app. Then we provide mobile-specific features on what we call, or what I like to call, the core mobile application platform to help you manage, uh, create teams and collaborations within your developers that uh, allow, bring functionality, things like analytics, things like resource monitoring on the cloud. By the way, forgot to mention, all of this is a cloud-based uh, platform. And so you have the mobile, what we can do for mobile dev, what we can do for, uh, in terms of functionality within the platform for uh, administrators, for IT organizations, for developers, of course. And then a, a very important piece there, which is what is called the mobile backend as a service, or MBAS. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, it's the services that we provide as a platform, some of them very specific for the, to develop mobile apps, things like caching, things like storage, things like data synchronization, very specific to help developers put in more of the functionality on the platform as opposed to on the client side, right? So, and then one very important piece of that and bus functionality, that uh, mobile backend as a service, is for you to build your, your own services, for you to integrate with other products and backend systems. Easy, uh, Great example here, the use of JBoss BPM, business process management, and the use of uh, Fuse, right? If some of you are familiar with Fuse, been working with Fuse, very easy to take advantage of that, those already existing backend enterprise integrations into our platform, all the way to provide that information to mobile apps. So with that, I'm gonna let John and Kian walk you to the details, and we'll be around all week, uh, the next few days for any questions uh, we'll, we'll leave, uh, uh, if we have time, some Q&A at the end of the session. If not, we'll be around. All right, thank you. Thanks, Javier. Okay, so a little bit of a look at what we're going to cover this morning. Um, going to start by taking a look at what Node.js is. So, um, contrary to the fact that predominantly we're probably talking to a Java audience, so want to give it a background on Node itself. Could I just ask how many people here have heard of or used Node.js? 
Wow, okay, excellent, excellent, superb. Okay, going to talk then a little bit about microservices and how they apply to mobile. So again, just to get some indication, um, how many people are familiar with the concepts of microservices? Okay, good, good. Our work here is complete. Yes, we're done, thank you very much. Um, then we're going to look at the process that, that we encourage people to use when building an application. Going to look at an example use case that pulls a lot of this together, and then, God help us, we're going to try and do some live coding. Okay, so Node.js, um, first thing to say, it's JavaScript, not Java, and it's JavaScript outside of the browser. It works on an event loop rather than a thread-based system, so you only have a single thread and an event loop processing requests. Um, an event comes in, it's processed until it hits an I.O. operation, put on a background process to do the I.O. operation, and then the next thing on the event loop is processed. So one of the things that means is that you get a very small memory footprint, which is brilliant for microservices because you don't want a large monolith, you want a nice small application. Node itself is very, very modular, so the core of Node is quite small, and then there's a, a really thriving ecosystem of modules that independent developers create and make available. As I said, it's absolutely ideal for microservices with its small memory footprint and the way it does I.O. and the way it does streaming. So it's very much based on the concept of streaming information through rather than buffering a lot of information, which allows you to um, do large data transmission through Node with a very small memory footprint. And with the event loop and the, the single threaded approach, with things we put on the background when they hit I.O. operations, so for file system or network or database. Again, it makes it very efficient and very economical in terms of its footprint, which, as I say, is absolutely ideal for microservices. So a couple of facts and figures about Node. It's six years old now. It was conceived in May 2009. It's currently on version 0.12.4, so officially it's not actually a 1.0 product, but in reality it's, it's been used as 1.0 for probably the last three years or more. It's very, very active. It has almost 2,000 stars on GitHub, and the Node core base has had 11,500 commits to it, so very, very active project. The ecosystem is even more active. It has a little over 158,000 modules, so these are independent node modules that you can use in your application so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something. And in terms of actual use, there has been 1.6 billion downloads of node modules in the last month alone. So that's not overall, that's just in the last month, 1.6 billion downloads. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about microservices and how they apply to mobile. And what I want to do is kind of compare and contrast your traditional development approach with your mobile approach. So traditional systems tend to be systems of record. It's where your data is persisted and stored, where mobile applications tend to be systems of engagement. So you have the app in your hand, you're interacting with data, and then it's going back to some back-end system. Your typical applications tend to be monolithic applications with a lot of features, whereas mobile applications tend to be small, focused, highly targeted to a specific need. With your traditional approach, you tend to have very long development cycles, which is costly, and results in infrequent, large updates. So you typically see updates maybe once every six months, 12 months, maybe even once every 18 months. So very long cycles. Whereas with mobile applications, you have much faster iteration, because they're smaller, they're far more affordable, and you tend to follow a kind of a DevOps, continuous development, continuous integration, continuous deployment approach. Now, when we look at the mobile way, and we look at the bullet points there, almost all of them are also the microservice way. Small, highly targeted, fast development cycle, continuous development and release. So what this actually tells us is that mobile applications are microservices. They're just microservices on your device, in your hand, on your phone. And that's very, very good because it fits perfectly with the entire paradigm that we look at in terms of development. 
So some of the other things to consider about mobile versus web or desktop applications, and in particular, how they communicate. So typically with your desktop applications, you're on a very good network, you're either hardwired in on an Ethernet cable or you have good Wi-Fi, which means that your application can make as many requests as it wants and it doesn't really matter how big the payload is. Contrast with mobile applications, particularly when they're being used by field workers out in bad signal areas. You're on crappy, lossy networks. The overhead of HTTP requests increase significantly because the network is so bad and you really have to trim your payload to only return the information that the mobile application needs. There's no point in returning 150 fields when the mobile application only needs three or four of them. It's complete waste. Okay, now let's look at how mobile applications tend to be deployed versus web applications. So with your typical web application, it's hosted, you push an update out, next time a user refreshes, they get the updated application. Mobile applications, it's very, very different. So if you have an enterprise app store, you can push a new build of an application, you can force users to update. So you can typically get new builds into users' hands in a matter of days, which is not too bad. But when you look at consumer mobile applications in the public app stores, you initially have several hours of pain trying to fill in all of the fields that they make you fill in when you're publishing a mobile application, so your title, your description, your this, your that, your images, oh my god. You then have a review process that can be anything from days to weeks, and particularly with iOS, you're, you're typically looking at about two weeks of a review process before the application even launches, and then weeks to months to potentially never to get your users to update the application, because with consumer applications, you can't force a user to update. You can only make the update available and hope that they take it. And for reference, in my app store right now, I have 113 updates pending. So I'm a prime example of that. <laughs> I have none. Oh, well then, well then. <laughs> I'm a good boy. But what, what this tells us is the more logic you put in the app on the client side, the more likely you're going to have to do frequent updates for bug fixes, for tweaks, for, for whatever. So when you're looking at developing mobile applications, if you can keep the mobile app itself as thin and simple as possible, you reduce the size of the code footprint, you reduce the amount of resources the app needs on the mobile device itself, but most importantly, you reduce the cadence at which you typically need to push out updates. Okay, so I'm going to pull all this together now with an example use case. So slightly contrived, blame Kean for this. So we have this fictional application that places orders for umbrellas. And when it's going to place the order, it wants to check what the forecast is going to be like. So if it's going to rain a lot, it will scale up the order that the person using the device has placed based on predicted rainfall. And then it'll send an SMS message when the order is complete. So you're looking at three individual services you want to integrate with there. You have a weather service, you have an order service, and you have an SMS service. So the, the typical approach people would look to take with that is you have your mobile application. Where is my laser pointer? Yay. You have your mobile application. You have your three individual services. And typically what you'd see happen is the application makes a request to the weather service and gets back the full payload of weather data, even though all it needs is the rainfall count. Uses that to calculate information on what the order should be sends a large footprint order, gets back the full response to the order, and then figures out who and how and where to send the SMS to. So you have the application tightly coupled with three services. You're seeing multiple requests, and if you remember what we talked about in terms of HTTP payload and multiple HTTP requests being bad for mobile applications. You have large payloads, you're getting a massive amount of information back on your weather here, when all you want is probably 10 bytes of data, and you have a lot of logic on the client side for parsing all of these interactions. So how do we improve this? We improve this by introducing a microservice dedicated to the mobile application. So this guy here in the middle, his only reason in life is to service the mobile client. He doesn't exist without the mobile client. 
So what we get here is we get a loose coupling. These services can change in the background and the mobile client will be an underwiser. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, what else do you get? You get a single request rather than three requests. You get only the data sent and back that you need. And you get a much dumber client because it no longer has to mediate all of this communication and figure out, strip out the data it needs and make the additional requests. So the client is a lot, lot simpler. So much better architecture there using this dedicated microservice for the mobile. So what does that actually mean out in the field? What we have here is a fairly simple benchmark we did using that sample use case with 100 iterations. And we benchmarked it across different networks. So on the 4G network, there's very little difference. You get, you get good speeds. You're not going to see much. There's, there's a slight hit with the, um, doing the client-side business logic. On 3G, it becomes a little bit more apparent when you have the processing on the client side and you have the multiple requests. On edge, you're up to about 30 seconds. And GPRS, you're up over two minutes for the benchmark. So your app is effectively unusable at this point. The other thing we notice, back to the payload trimming, with the mobile microservice approach, there was only 68K of data in total transmitted for the benchmarks. With the individual requests, because we were getting back all the weather information and all the order information, it was 1.5 meg of data. So 68K versus 1.5 meg. OK. So this is the typical process that we use and we recommend in the platform for building an application. So you start by creating a project. And the project is basically the container for everything to do with that, that mobile solution. So it will have client apps that live on your mobile device or that are web apps. And it will have a Node.js microservice. And then typically the first step before our front-end developers and our back-end developers go their separate ways is you define your APIs. So you define what APIs you're going to expose to the mobile client. And typically, you just fill them with mock data. And at that point, the mobile developer, the front-end developer, has enough information to go off and build his application because he has the APIs that he needs for building his application. They're there. They're live. Granted, they're returning mock data, but the mobile developer is now free to work in parallel with the back-end developer. So as the back-end developer builds out the logic and starts building integrations to, to MBAS services and to back-ends, the client developer is building his application. And as the back-end developer gets his integrations working, he swaps out the mocks for the real endpoints. And because we have this mobile microservice, it's possible to massage whatever data you're getting from your back-end systems and make it conform to the API you laid down right at the very start. Some other things to note here, the front-end developer has the option of building his mobile apps within the platform. So you don't actually need, using the Red Hat mobile platform, you don't actually need developer tools on your machines. There's a, a build farm hosted in the cloud. You give it source code, it gives you back a binary. And we'll take a look at that during the, the live session. Um, similarly, the back-end developer doesn't have to figure out a third-party hosting solution. There's a paths for hosting the Node.js microservice cloud code, again, built into the platform. And we'll see this in a few minutes. So a couple of the tools we're going to be looking at with the live demo today. Obviously, we'll be using the mobile application platform itself. Um, we use Git an awful lot, so that should be familiar to most developers. Very simple flow for Git. The platform hosts your source code, clone it, develop locally, push it back, build, and deploy. We'll be using Grunt, which is a, a task runner tool uh, written in Node.js on the client side. Built here in Boston, too. <coughs> Did not know that. There you go. So we'll be using that for doing local development. And obviously, we will also be using Node.js. So what we're actually going to build, it's not our weather service one. What we're going to build is a barcode scanner application. So this will allow you to see a list of recent searches done on the website searchupc.com. 
Um, so that's a website that allows you to enter in a barcode number and gives you back details on the product that the barcode refers to. It also gives a list of what people have been searching for recently. It can be kind of funny to have a look at what people are searching for. Um, I found somebody searching for a 12 gun gun safe. It's somebody who takes their home defense pretty seriously. So we have the mobile app. We have the Node.js microservice. And then we have a suite of MBAS services that we're integrating with. So we have the one that integrates with searchupc.com. We did have one that integrated with Fuse for doing order processing. Now, unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties um, quite recently, which means that we had to switch out the Fuse integration with a very simple in-memory order service. But the interesting thing is we were able to do that without any change to the client-side logic here because we had this guy mediating in the middle. So we quickly coded up a very simple DOM ordering service and swapped it out for the Fuse one. And we also then have an image streaming service. So the barcode reader gives us back the URL of the image associated with a product. And this guy then calls in here and says, right, give me the actual data for that image so that when it sends the response back to the client, the client doesn't get a URL and have to make a call externally for the image. It gets back base64 encoded data of the product image. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kian. Alrighty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how much I can break. All right. So, this is the Feed Henry platform. Let's bump up the font size a little bit so you guys can see it. All right. And I'm going to jump into the project screen. And we've got one project here, this barcode project. So, again, we see this three column view that John talked about earlier. Over on the left here, we've got the barcode client. This is where we put the HTML5 application, but this could be a, an Android app, it could be an iOS app. There could be multiple clients involved here. Here in the middle is where the logic specific for this project exists. It's where we meld all of the stuff together. And over here on the right, we have these reusable integrations. And these integrations we've built in such a way that they're reusable across multiple projects. That's really important. So the logic in here should be a pretty thin little mediation layer. The real clever smarts should be over here, so it can be reused across multiple projects. The first thing I'm going to do is jump into the barcode client. And on the right-hand side, we see a mobile phone preview of the app. We can scroll around in the application, and we can interact with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take one of these most recent barcodes, which is a bit of a risk because we're never quite sure what people are searching for. We're going to go ahead and search for that. All right, so somebody had ordered a London Compact Guide in French. That could have gone a lot worse. Yeah, that's not for too bad, actually. For $25.10. OK. So what we can do is we can go ahead and process an order for this guy by hitting Order This. And we'll see it appear in our orders. There we go. So we get the option to delete the order if we want. We see the barcode ID. And then we see we've ordered 1x at $25. So that was pushed out to that right-hand column. We're using all three, all three, am I right? Yeah, all three. three of the services. So the barcode search, the image, streaming, and the order service. All right. So now that we've seen uh, these three guys in use in the mobile application, let's first look at the mobile app code that achieves this. So I'm going to jump into the editor. And of course, I'm free to clone this into my own machine as well. And we'll take a look at the HTML code first of all. So because this is a hybrid application, we can see that this HTML code in the browser is what's rendering the app on the right. No great surprises there, really simple stuff. We're not even using any libraries here just to make life really easy. And in fact, that's quite small. So maybe I'll clone this down and simulate a little bit of the local development flow. We have a clone already. We have a clone already. All right, great. Do. Better still. Here's one I prepared earlier, huh? Have you bumped your font size by any chance? I certainly have. All right, prepared. It's probably not bumped enough, though. Yeah, we can bump it some more. So what John has done earlier is he's used that git clone URL to clone the application onto his own computer. Uh, and now we can make changes here and push it back up to the platform if we so desire. The other thing we can do is in our terminal, we can run, oop, funny keyboard. I'm used to a US keyboard. I've only been here two years, and I'm already converted. Grunt serve. And that allows us to run the application on our local machine. So this has actually stood up the application on my machine right here. Well, John's machine, technically. Let's not get too attached. I can go ahead and make some changes to the code. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to change, let's change localhost 
9001, I believe. Oh. Or is it 8? On 8001. 9001. 8000. You see the ah, 8001. I'm in the wrong directory, that's why. So it would help if I had the right directory. Barcode project client, grunt serve. Mm, npm install. Man, we're going great here. All right. So I'm going to install the dependencies. <coughs> because we're using grunt, it's a little funny. Our client side project has a package.json file, which we do need to install from. Grunt serve. And now, ta da! My app is running locally. So I can make changes right in the, uh, in the IDE of my choice. We're using Atom. Uh, you could use WebStorm. You could use Eclipse. You could use Emacs. You could use Vim. We don't tend to judge. All right. I do. <laughs> so let's go ahead and open the CSS, maybe. Uh, I'm going to try and find out where this blue color is set. So I'm going to use my inspector, just like I would normally developing you know, on any application that I'm working on. And we see it's this hex code. OK, so I'm going to copy this into my clipboard. Command C. And I'm going to go ahead and find this in the source code. Here we see it. Let's make it orange instead to go with my hair or something. I don't know. And there we go. So we see the application has changed color right there in the browser. It's just a really quick development flow that allows me to iterate on the mobile application much quicker than I would if I was uh, you know, developing using Cordova standalone and had to launch a simulator and wait for it to launch. Uh, and once I'm happy with my changes, I can go ahead and commit them and push them back to Feed Henry. So we've seen the client side. Maybe we'll explore the JavaScript a little bit that actually performs these integrations. It's nothing too surprising. All we're doing is these $fh.cloud calls inside in our application's barcode code. So up here at the top, we see this get barcode function. And I'm just going to highlight this little function here. So what we've done here is we've said, hey, reach out to my cloud code and read a barcode. You'll see that we just specify the path. We don't specify the host name. And that's one of the cool things that the platform automatically does in the background. It's able to wire up those client-side applications, this guy on the left-hand side. Let me jump back to my three-column view. Without even specifying a host name, this guy on the left-hand side knows which guy in the middle to talk to, and we can automatically reconfigure that on the fly. So that's one of the neat things. We don't need to you know, hard-code a host name into the, the client-side binary that goes on the device. So if we've got some sort of um, you know, domain that might have gone down, or maybe we forgot to renew the domain, and our boss is angry, we can rewire things. So that's the client-side code. Have you cloned the services as well already? Yep. Excellent. So the other thing I wanted to show you guys, as well as the client-side logic that does this integration into the back-end system, is these guys on the right-hand side. So we're going to take a little dive into the barcode service in particular. So this barcode service integrates with searchupc.com. And I want to show you guys some of the kind of intricacies of searchupc.com, because it's really quite a funny little, uh, little web service. Order service. Barcode reader cloud. There we go. All right, excellent. So the barcode service, SOAP serves up SOAP. And as we all know, SOAP isn't the most uh, convenient language to talk in a mobile application. In fact, it can get a little funky. But not only does Search EPC serve up SOAP, it serves up SOAP with some CSV embedded in one of the fields, which gives you the barcode data. I don't know why it does this. We just accept it. And this is something that we see really often in enterprise integrations. These kind of harebrained ideas to, you know, on some sort of legacy system that's been sitting around forever, all of a sudden they'll you know, embed some CSV into a field. It can happen. You know, these systems are out there, and sometimes we need to integrate with them. So what, what this really shows is how easy it is to integrate with services like this in Node.js and to iterate on them very quickly without needing to kind of expose the, you know, the nastiness to the client side. So what I've done here is we hit up searchupc.com. No, it's. You're on the recent one there. That's, yep. We hit up searchupc.com. We search for the, uh, the barcode. In fact, no, we retrieve the WSDL file first. So what we've done is we've initiated a SOAP client in Node.js using one of these modules that John talked about earlier, a module called Node SOAP. It's one of the 130, 150,000 odd. Very it's original the, name, though. Very original name, right? It's one of the better ones. And what, it, what that allows us to do is say, OK, here's where the WSDL is at. Give me a SOAP client. 
And I know from looking at the, uh, the SOAP, at the WSDL file in SOAP UI or one of those other tools, that there's a get product function exposed inside in that SOAP client. So our SOAP client comes back with a get product operation. I can give it a barcode and an access token, just a simple API key. And once I give it a barcode and an access token, it gives me back a response from the endpoint. Now this response I've called response as CSV, because the response, like I said, doesn't just come back as SOAP, we're able to pluck off, off of this SOAP service, and it's a little hard to see my highlighter here, but hopefully you guys can see this. We're picking off this get product result, which is a SOAP field, and then we're passing this into a CSV parser. All we're doing with the CSV parser is saying, hey, look, this CSV has the first row with some column names, uh, and the second row onwards is the actual data we want to interrogate. And down here, we get the parsed response back as JSON. So to rehash, we've reached out to a WSDL, found out what operations are available to us, made use of one of those operations, specifically the get product operation, plucked a field off of our get product operation after passing it a barcode, seen that that field is CSV, massaged the CSV into JSON, and then last but not least, returned it back to the client. So an incredibly convoluted flow and something that would be really horrific to have to do on a mobile device. I mean, if we tried to do, build this integration right on the mobile device in my pocket, let's say the, the UPC search service suddenly changed their API and decided to return JSON or deprecate the SOAP or stop returning CSV and SOAP for some bizarre reason, um, all of a sudden our mobile integration will be you know, completely hosed. When we've built this into this one little microservice, it means we've abstracted ourselves from that kind of risk of um, you know, the integration changing and us being locked out in the cold in our mobile app, waiting for that long mobile app update cycle. So I've showed you guys the code behind the barcode service. And so I think actually, let's, let's quickly take a look at the recent one, because that's slightly different again. Ah. So on searchupc.com. Yeah, we are the, the kings here of uh, funky integrations. Did I, did I see some screen scraping there by yes, any chance? Yes, you did. All right. So um, their API doesn't give you the, the most recent five searches, and we wanted that as well in the application. But we have it here in their HTML page. So if we inspect the element, let's have a little poke around in here. We can see, what can we see? We can see a table with an ID of sample searches. So back in our code, what we're doing here is we're making a HTTP request to the searchupc.com endpoint. We're getting a response back and jQuert. We're able to dynamically inject jQuery into the HTML response we get back so we can start using jQuery in this microservice to poke at the HTML and pull some interesting things back. So we inject our jQuery. We find our element with the ID current searches. We can see here that there is rows of data with A records in them. So they're clickable links, and we can see that the value in here is the barcode ID. So we iterate over every A record. We take the inner HTML, which is the barcode data. We push it into a JSON array, and then we return that. So again, within the microservice, in this case, we're sucking in HTML. We're pulling the bits we want out of it, and we're able to return a nice JSON API back with the recent searches. And to reiterate, this is not us advocating screen scraping or advocating SOAP services that return CSV just for the heck of it. The reality is, you know, sometimes we need to make these kind of funky little integrations to get data back. And the really key take home here is that in Node.js, you can get data just about any way you want. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the real world. This is, this is what external services and backend systems look like. You're, you're going to be working with systems that you have no control over, and they're going to be returning data in disgusting formats, and you just got a deal. And the best way of dealing with it is to isolate and encapsulate the, the logic that takes that nasty data and turns it into something nice, so that when the back-end service administrators make the data even nastier, you can just update your microservice, and bang, everything is working again. And if you're using that microservice in 10 different projects, you fix it once here, and all 10 projects start working again. So the other thing to quickly look at here is we have our API and we have our logic, but how does someone know how to, how to use and interact with this microservice? 
So they know how to use and interact with it via a very simple um, API Blueprint markdown file. So API Blueprint allows you to extend markdown and define the APIs that are available in your service. So we have a pretty simple API Blueprint definition here, only 40 lines long, that exposes the barcode recent and the barcode read endpoints. And back within the platform, we have this API browser here for the barcode service. Let's just bump that up a little bit. And this is taking that markdown and it's rendering it into an interactive discovery console. So anyone who wants to use this service can come in here, look at the documentation, and more than look at it, they can actually interact with the service live. So you hit your submit, and bang, there you go. There's your barcodes back. We can take one of them and move down to the read endpoint. Fingers crossed that this is um, appropriate. <laughs> Not another gun safe. And in this case, they it don't have exist. any data. So someone searched for something that didn't exist. So of course, the challenge of plucking off the most recent searches from the website is that quite often people will search for something that just doesn't exist at all. There okay. we go. Avengers Assemble Hopper. Oh, that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting one of those. Thirteen ninety nine. Can we hit the buy button? We don't have a buy button here, but we have one in the app. Sure, sure. OK, so what data do we have here? We have the product name, the image URL, product URL, price, currency. Um, so we have a bit of data here that we don't really want in the mobile application as well, but that's OK. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, and we also have this image URL. So as we discussed a few minutes ago, we don't really want to send this URL back to the client and have the client have to make that extra HTTP request. And we talked earlier about locking apps out of the app store in the kind of update cycle. If we're hot linking image, images in our mobile application rather than you know, serving them up ourselves, that's not a very nice thing to do to webmasters. Hot linking from a mobile app, you know, suddenly if the webmaster decides to block mobile hosts or something, doesn't like the fact that we're stealing their images, they could quite easily break our integration. So what we've done is we've built this streaming image service, which John is going to show you guys now, which allows us to proxy this image through our cloud. So, and if we end up having issues with the image, we have control over where the data comes from. So this is a really, really micro, 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 micro service. Mm -hmm. It has one endpoint. And it takes a URL and a parameter to tell it whether to return the data as binary or base64. So let's go ahead and say we want base64. And we submit. And voila, base64 data for our image URL. There's an Avengers hopper in there somewhere, by the way. This is actually the Red Hat logo. Oh, was it? Oh, OK. <laughs> so let's take a look at that one. Image, image, image. So in all its glory, 29 lines. And this is, this is going back to some of the things we were talking about earlier about Node.js, about modules, and about streaming. So we're using two main modules here. We're using the request module, which allows us to make HTTP requests and stream responses back. And we're using the base64 stream module, which allows us to intercept the binary data coming back and on the fly convert it to base64. So you stream the binary through, base64 comes out the other side. And the, these pipes kind of hurt back to the whole Unix philosophy that Node.js follows. And I think most good kind of programming technologies and technology in general follows this kind of Unix philosophy of using pipes to stream data. It's really very comparable. So we're taking in our two parameters. We're checking to see if we want base64. If we do, we use the request module to call the image. We pipe that through our base64 streamer. And then we pipe that to our response object. If we don't want base64 encoding, it's even simpler. We make a request. We pipe it straight to the response. So we're just flowing the image data through the microservice. OK, let's pull it all together. So our mobile microservice, the thing that provides the functionality to the client. Let's have a look at its API. The thing that gives that mobile client one cohesive API, rather than doing multiple hops to our microservices on the right hand side. Because of course, microservices is a, you know, a fantastic architecture for mobile. But if we still haven't you know, built APIs for, one sing for mobile devices, we're still making unnecessary hops to, to various services all over the house. 
So again, we can see we have a barcode recent, and this is actually calling through to the microservice, which in turn is calling out to search UPC. We have the API for reading the barcode, and we have APIs for processing orders. So get a list of your current orders, add an item, update quantity, and remove an item from the order. So they're the APIs that the client needs. And when we started developing this sample application, this was the first thing we did. We laid down these APIs, and then Kian went off and developed the front end. I went off and developed the integrations, and we met in the middle. And it, it works. It really works very, very nicely. We didn't even have an argument. No, but we might. <laughs> OK, so let's take a look at this code. And so this is our recent route. So one of the things that we're introducing here is caching. So we don't want to be hitting search UPC for every mobile client every time someone wants a list of recent barcodes. So imagine a scenario where this is installed on 100,000, a million, 10 million devices. Search UPC are not going to love us. So the first thing we do is we check to see, do we have the recent barcode searches cached? If we don't, we make a call to our mobile microservice, to the barcode one, again saying what path we want. We get the response back, we stick it in the cache. Uh, we stick it in, in this case, just for 10 seconds. If we do have cache data, we return it. So we can see, if we call this guy, and call him, much, much quicker. Yeah, I would put that first one in about 1,500 milliseconds, and now it's instant. So you can really tell that it's no longer reaching out to the back end. And there, and there it's we changed, go. yep. Um, if we were to look at the logs for the application, we can see no cache data, returning service data. Returning cache, 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 and then back to service data. So again, we're, we're putting a layer of caching in, we're putting the information as close as possible to the edge of the hosted part of the system so that the mobile application can get the data back as quickly as possible. For the read function, Again, we have our cache. If we have a cache for the specific barcode that's been searched for, we return it. If not, we call into the service to get the, um, the data on the barcode. And then we check to see if we have an image URL. So some of them do, some of them don't have images associated with them. If we have an image URL, we call into our image service and say, Give me back this image in base64. We stick the base64 data into the object we're returning, and then we call this return barcode info function, which is an inner function here. And at this point, then, we strip out the unnecessary information, the bits that the mobile application doesn't need. So this is back to what we said about payload trimming. We're cutting the payload down as small as possible to just return the information that the application needs. And we can see that similarly. The English Springer Spaniel, your essential guide from puppy to senior dog, best this of breed. We've been really lucky today. There's we have. Nothing that gets us in trouble. Wow. And we can see now, different from the, from the barcode microservice, which just returned the image URL, we now have the base64 data injected into the response, and we've stripped out all of those unnecessary fields. And, and of course, our image service could be doing so much more with those pipes. I mean, even yesterday, as part of our keynote prep, we've thrown, in, thrown into the pipe a uh, image magic resizing Stream, again, you know, one line of code that takes image, images in a PNG format and compresses them down into thumbnails and spits them out the other side of the stream. So there is so much that you can plug into these uh, streaming modules in the, uh, in the NPM repository. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we can see the logs here telling us exactly what's going on. Service data, then cache data, cache data, cache data. So. That pretty much covers off. Now that we've shown how the, uh, the barcode cloud 
makes a more cohesive API, maybe it will be worth showing just how easy it is to build that integration on the mobile client. Uh, I very quickly touched on the, um, the API that we use to call read barcode, but let's now see what it does with the response. Because if it wasn't for the fact that we're returning this one cohesive API, we would have to do an awful lot more work. So earlier I had these three lines highlighted, this barcode read. Now we see the response that comes back. What we're doing is we're getting the, uh, the cloud response element and we're throwing in the image base64 encoded into the image source tag. So that's already fetched, remember, you know, the, the app doesn't need to do another request to get this image. We're also, we're also throwing in the name of the product and the price. So we've wrapped up all of these API, API calls into one dollar fh.cloud call, rather than doing three or four of them from the mobile app, either synchronously or asynchronously. We're not introducing any sort of crazy callback out. Our mobile integration is really, really simple. And so, and you'll see also that we're not using anything like a templating language. We're really just throwing stuff into the DOM for the sake of a simple demo. But if we were to kind of, you know, tidy this up a little bit more and put in some templates, this would be a really easy kind of readable piece of front end code. Uh, very different from what we would have had if we tried to integrate with all of these microservices on the right. So do you want to show the app maybe? Yeah, let's do that. Do you have a reflector here? I do. Ready. So are they both in the same Wi-Fi? Hope so. I hope so. So one of the killers at conferences is when reflector, when we launch this reflector thing, it uses AirPlay to mirror the device, but quite often they end up on different subnets because there's like probably 100 routers in the ceiling here, and, and you know we're never quite sure which one it's going to appear on, but it worked. Sweet. Hey. All right. Okay. So here is our application. Let me just restart it. So it is our application calling our recent searches endpoint. We can select one of these, an artist pencil. We are being very lucky. Yeah. Okay, so the other <laughs> thing the application does, and we're going to look at how simple this was to integrate as well, is we've integrated a barcode scanner. Now usually when we uh, try out this barcode scanner, we use a book, but, uh, and usually I've been using Donald Knuth's The Art of Computer Programming. Today I'm using some Sierra Mist just to introduce some balance into the equation rather than being all highfalutin. And unfortunately, Sierra Mist have chosen to put their barcode in silver. Let's try tilting it. Yeah. So it's a very hard barcode to scan. I feel like one of those folks at the checkout. All right, there we go. I think you're sideways though, right? No? No? Okay. Okay, so it finally, finally, finally read the barcode. And search. It worked earlier. Yeah, it probably read the wrong barcode. Do you have another cam? I tried that it's one fantastic. earlier and it didn't work. We tried the water, that didn't work either. It doesn't seem to be in the search GPC database. Stick to Knuth. Yeah, yeah, stick to Knuth, that's right. Yay, there we go. excellent. So if anyone has anything with a barcode, we can prove that it's not mocked up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the barcode scanner integration. All right, so the last thing that we're gonna show last, 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 I keep saying that, is how we integrate into the barcode scanner itself. Okay, so one of the things that you'll find when building hybrid mobile applications is that you need to include uh, Cordova plugins. And including Cordova plugins has gotten a lot easier, but it's really, really easy within Feed Henry to add in a Cordova plugin. So all we have to do we have a, a base plugin configuration where we specify all of the plugins that we use in this application, and we decided to pop in the barcode scanner as well. So we threw in this barcode scanner spec. We say, hey, it's the uh, 2.0.1 version of the barcode scanner. Here's the uh, Git repository you can get it from, and this is the name of it. And by virtue of the fact that we've done that, and built our application in Feed Henry, which we'll also do in a moment, we're able to do this cordova.plugins.barcodescanner.scan. That triggers the camera on the device using the, the native hybrid bridge that Cordova gives us, calls the, uh, the camera, overlays a little barcode scanner you know, square along with the red line, picks out the barcode, plucks off the, uh, the UPC ID off of that barcode, and then gives it back to our hybrid application. So here we get the result.txt, which is the value of the barcode, and we send it through to our uh, get barcode call. So really, really easy. We just echo the, uh, the barcode out onto the text field on the screen. I don't have it open here in front of me. That's okay. 
So that's how easy it is to integrate with these kind of native hybrid bridge plugins in Cordova using the platform. And instead of having to manually check in the source code for the plugin for each platform, for iOS, for Android, having to test each one on device, all we need to do is include it in this plugins config kind of uh, JSON file here, and it's automatically included at build time. So speaking of build time, That's I guess we built. should build the app. All right, so we're gonna grab our barcode client. We're gonna go to the build screen, and this is pretty unique, because what we're able to do here is instead of uh, having to have native build tools installed on our device, you know, here I've got a MacBook, but uh, maybe I have a, a Linux machine at home and I wanna try and build for iPad or iPhone, I'm kinda locked out. I need native Apple hardware to, to be able to build. Likewise for Windows Phone, I'd need a Windows device here to, to build for Windows Phone, heaven forbid. Um, so instead, I can use the cloud-powered build farm and generate builds right here in the browser. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick Android. We're gonna build a debug build. Yep. We're gonna target the barcode cloud, that guy in the middle, and we're gonna uh, go ahead. So, so ju just to, to highlight, this is where if, say you were revving up the version of your cloud application, you had multiple ones in the middle version one, version two, version three. You get to choose when you build a client app which cloud application, which mobile microservice you actually want to talk to. And that can be configured and modified after the fact. So you can actually repoint an application that's been built and installed on thousands of devices. On the fly, you can point it to a new uh, Node.js microservice in the cloud, which provides a, a really nice configurable loose coupling. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit build. And what this is now doing is bundling up the source code of our application, spitting it out in a targz file to one of our Android build boxes running in the cloud. And it's gonna go ahead and use the, uh, the native, I guess what was once Ant, but is now Gradle yep. file to build the, uh, the mobile application. And it will eventually spit back to us an APK file, which we can download and upload into the, uh, you know, the Google Play Store, an MDM solution, MAM solution, send it by email, It'll also give us a short URL. And the last thing that it will give us is a QR code that we can scan right on the screen using Red Laser or one of these other QR code scanner applications. And that'll allow us to install the app onto our device. And in fact, if any of you guys have an Android app, by all means, feel free to scan the barcode and uh, do your own you know, barcode searches or do your own recent barcode search, search roulette. And we can also see here we have a history of all the previous builds. So you have control over what's been built previously. You can download old builds. You have a full archive of all your builds. So do I see any devices coming out? Some people hesitantly scanning. Try, try to do it down low and recent not barcode anyone see. is great fun. Maybe, maybe somebody will get something a little more risque. So I guess we've got about five minutes left. Do we have time for some questions? I think we do. All right, does anybody have any questions? Come on, there must be one. We're not leaving here till we get a question. Right, there we, we go. Question. Yeah, so it's because of the way it's event based, what you typically have is a lot of callbacks. So it does have concurrency because what's happening is you have the event loop processing a request. And typically, it spends microseconds or milliseconds executing a block of code, and then invariably hits I.O. So it puts it off onto a background thread, and it executes the next thing until that hits I.O., and it continues to do that. It just keeps processing the next thing in the loop until it hits I.O. or until the request completes, and then it moves on. So you actually get very, very good concurrency and amazing throughput, particularly for web applications and these kinds of integration applications where you're spending most of your time waiting on something else to happen, whether it's file, database, remote service. Oh, good question, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Okay. Yes. Yes, this yeah. guy yep. here. So how would you approach having maybe different clients that is the same middle tier with different payload requirements? Like maybe I had more support and tablets. 
with like bigger yeah, resolution yeah. images. Yeah, yeah. 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 Typically, you would either define additional APIs here, and you'd be able to reuse most of the code and just trim the payload differently. So you move the, the integration part down into a common function and then decide what payload you want to respond. So it actually, it could be the same API and you just do uh, user agent detection, or you could have separate APIs for barcode read, tiny barcode read, some data, barcode read, loads of data. You could, you could modify the APIs um, to provide additional APIs or, as I say, device detection. Or additionally, if you wanted to, if it was completely different logic, you can stand up a new application. So now we have two cloud applications. You can choose which one when you go in here to build. You now have two options, and you can pick which one you want. And as I said, after the fact, you can go into your connections area here, and you get to see all of the clients that have been built, and you can reconfigure an application to either talk to a different cloud endpoint or to talk to a different environment. So there's also support for full lifecycle management, so moving your applications and your cloud services and your MBAS connectors through the development process, through dev, test, QA, pre-prod, prod. So you get to define your, uh, your life cycles here as well. Any other questions? Down at the back? Right. Yeah. You, can, you can also create, let's see. So there's a whole bunch of native destinations provided. John's creating a native Android app. You can also create a native iOS app, and there are SDKs for that. There's SDKs for things like Accelerator and Xamarin. Uh, and then there's some templates as well out of the box for things like Backbone and Angular and Ionic and so on. So quite a vast array of, uh, of client yeah. devices. I mean, I've got an app running on my watch as well. You know, so a huge, vast array of, of different types of devices. And this client column here also supports web applications. So a lot, a lot of the time, the kind of solution we see is applications on the device and some kind of back office web portal that's controlling the flow of data to the devices. So if you want to, you can create a web application here. Again, deploy it and host it in the FeedHenry cloud and people using a desktop or a laptop can interact with the web application. And again, it's talking to the same cloud apps and integrating with the same MBAS services. So before you guys go, and I've probably accosted some of you in the corridor already with this guy, we're doing an Internet of Things demo tomorrow uh, as part of the middleware keynote. And we're looking for volunteers to carry these guys around. Now, there's no prereqs, no requirements at all. All you have to do is carry this around to your sessions. And there are little Raspberry Pi devices in the sessions tracking the sessions that you've attended. There's probably one in this room somewhere, although I don't see it. It's probably mounted to one of the walls. Um, it's not going to track you when you go to the restroom. It's not going to track you when you go to the pub or when you go home for a nap at the hotel at 3 o'clock. That's OK. All you guys need to do is pick up one of these for me and walk out the door. So anybody who wants a beacon, little iBeacon device, Bluetooth Low Energy, please do come grab one. That would be great. Well, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thanks, much. You. We're going to have a lot more sessions all week uh, about architecture, hands-on, full introduction onto the product, all the features. So come over. Thanks. <laughs>